Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. Welcome back to the show. Inflation is impacting everyone. And as it turns out, it's likely here to stay. So now what? We brought back Herman Simon, a Thinker's 50 inductee and pricing authority to discuss his latest book, Beating Inflation. If you're looking for a way to navigate our current climate, this episode's for you. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasily Sturos, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Joining us today on the show is Herman Simon. Herman, welcome back. So good to have you here. Hello, Vasilis. Mark, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. And and V will be a little bit late, but he'll be joining us really soon. Um, so Herman, just for people that haven't heard of you, uh, you're the literally the world's leading authority on pricing. Um, and you've been studying this and and practicing this for a long time. Uh, you're the founder and chairman of Simon Kutcher and Partners, which is the world's leading pricing advisor with offices in 27 countries. Um, you're you've been inducted into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame which is uh, an astonishing uh, accomplishment. You're a visiting professor at Harvard, Stanford, the Tokyo Business School, and said basically anywhere where people <laughs> who are thinking deeply about things go. Uh, and today we're talking about one of the many books that you've written, but this one specifically on inflation. And I'm super interested in talking to you about this um, and really grateful for your time. So thanks for joining. You're welcome. I look forward to our discussion. Yeah, me too. So, um, you know, a lot of people have noticed inflation is everywhere in the news. And um, and I really wanted to kind of dig into this because there's an interesting point in your book where you talk about how, um, like from a marketing perspective, this is one of those economic factors that doesn't happen all the time. And so there's, I remember my parents back I think it was the 80s, they were saying, you know, we had our mortgage rates were up to 28 or 23% or something to that effect, really high anyway. Um, and that was the last time I really heard of it. And so from a marketing perspective, you know, if we're trying to be market oriented and understand the customer mindset and that kind of thing, this is one of those anomalies that just doesn't happen all the time. So it's really great to talk to you about this. Can you, let's just start at the very, very beginning, if you don't mind, can you just give me an overview of what inflation is? Yeah we had a very special period in the last 30, 35 years with an average inflation rate of uh, two to 3%. So prices were essentially stable. That was mm -hmm. very different in the 1970s. Uh, we had the oil, actually two oil price shocks and uh, we had uh, inflation rates up to 10%. Um, mm. what, what does this mean? Inflation? Of course, mm -hmm. prices are going up, products are becoming more expensive, but the real core of inflation mm. is that money is losing its value. And uh, you, you can illustrate that uh, by, by using an historical example. I talk here of so-called fiat money. When God created the world from nothing. He spoke Latin and said, fiat lux, be it light, from nothing. And in <laughs> the same way, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, create our money from nothing. Mm -hmm. And if they create too much money, it's going to lose its value. And you can use a different kind of money, namely gold. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago, for an ounce of gold, you could buy a tailor-made tunica that was a robe of the Romans mm -hmm. for one ounce of gold. Today, you can buy a tailor-made suit for one ounce of gold. So the value of the product has not changed. What is changing is the value of the fiat money, the money created from nothing. And <laughs> um, that has lots of consequences. Money becomes a perishable fruit, you could say. So you have to get it as quickly, as fresh as possible, and then get rid of it. Mm -hmm. While my grandfather told me he, he worked in 1923 when we had hyperinflation in Germany. 
He said, when mm -hmm. I got my month's, my, my weekly salary, I ran immediately to a store and bought something to get rid of the money because next day it had only half its value. So <laughs> that is inflation. Money becomes a perishable good. So it's not just that things cost more. It's that you're, the value of money is decreasing as well. Is that fair? That is absolutely fair. Um, let's assume you invest some money and get a return of 7%. That's, that's already a good average in, in one mm -hmm. year. So you think that's okay. But if you count it in real terms and you have 10% inflation, you have actually 3% less. So right. In the real terms, and that is the, what can you buy for your money? In spite mm -hmm. of 7% uh, you make on the stock market, you get actually 3% less. Mm -hmm. I had a discussion with my money manager in New York. He, he said last year, <laughs> we made minus 12%. I said, you didn't make minus 12, you made minus 21 or so because we have... To <laughs> because of inflation. The inflation to this. So right. it's really a very, a very serious thing. And of course, it affects the purchasing power, especially of poor people who can no longer afford to, to buy certain things. So it's societally, socially, it's, uh, it's very serious. So, in, in like... You know, I'll, throughout this conversation, I'll keep coming back to a couple of ideas if, you know, from a, a consumer perspective. Um, we've been sort of, I don't know, lulled maybe is a way to say it into sort of normalcy or for markers anyway, that the inflation has been so steady for the last 20 years. We haven't really had to consider that in terms of what our consumers or customers and, and the buyers in the market are going through. And so now, especially in this mo in the last, let's call it year, six months to a year for sure, with inflation increasing, that's now changed a lot of their perceptions and is affecting how they perceive value in the market. Is that, is that fair? That's absolutely fair. During the price, a price stable time, so from 1990 till 2020, you didn't have to pay much attention to the price. It went up on the average 2%, but not. We, we see now that certain products uh, have a price increase of 50%. If we talk of the average of, of 10%, that is not reflecting each product. That varies between zero or even negative, some electronic mm -hmm. products, and uh, plus, plus 50. So you have now to pay much more attention to find a good deal. Where do you still get the product at lower price? Uh, do people take advantage of you, for instance, through shrinkflation, a topic which mm -hmm. uh, we are discussing, where they don't change the price but reduce, the shrink the package size. So all nasty things are happening during this uh, process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the shrinkflation thing is really interesting. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what we can do about it and how people compensate or companies compensate. I think that might be one of them we can come back to. Um, what are some of the main like are the causes of this inflationary period the same as the last one or are they change all the time or no is that different wow. uh, yeah in the 70s uh, we had the first oil price shock the oil price went up from 280 dollars per barrel to 12 dollars so five times more and mm -hmm. five years later in 1978 the oil price went up to 37 relative to the uh, starting point of 2.80 that was about uh, 15 almost 15 times more so that mm -hmm. was the main driver of the inflation in the 1970s now we have two categories of drivers um, the first category are the short-term drivers like uh, ukraine war corona uh, supply chain bottlenecks great frictions Mm -hmm. which lead to an undersupply of products. If you want to buy uh, electronic ships, you have a very difficult uh, time right now. I yeah. visited a huge warehouse this weekend and they had stored there 10 million 
wine bottles in the warehouse. <laughs> wow. the city. Why do they store? Uh, that was a project from a wine, a, a large wine trading company, because last year they couldn't get bottles. They could not sell their wine because they didn't have bottles. Now right. they bought 10 million bottles. Uh, probably the price is uh, 50% higher just to make sure that they can sell their wine. Without bottles, you cannot sell the wine. Yeah. Uh, so that was a volume of um, 50,000 cubic meters, which is about 500,000 cubic feet. Mm -hmm. Only bottles, mountains <laughs> of bottles, uh, 10 meters high. And, uh, mm -hmm. So this shows how these driving forces work. You couldn't get class because of the energy prices. Price goes up. And the wine trader has to buy it. Never mind what it costs. Otherwise, they cannot sell the wine. Mm -hmm. And the second category is the money supply. Since 2010, the money supply, the fiat money printed by the uh, Fed, has mm -hmm. gone up 500%. Mm -hmm. But the gross domestic product in the US in the same period has only gone up 50%. So there is simply too much money chasing too few goods. Hmm. I took a, we talked about this a little bit before, but uh, both B and I are doing our MBAs. And one of the courses we did was economics. And uh, the, one of the things I remember the prof saying is nothing fixes a high price like a high price from economics. So is that part of it too, where we're like, now we're seeing maybe the down slide of some of the inflationary factors. And I think you mentioned earlier the summer or, or 22, 2022 summer uh, inflation peaked and now it's kind of declining. Does it, is it like, I know and then the feds are also increasing interest rates to try and curb inflation. Is yeah. that, is that what's happening? That's, is that the driver for this reduction that we're seeing with inflation? Yes, uh, both. Um, the energy front has ceased in the maximum in the last uh, two years. Uh, the dollar price per barrel was at 125. Now it's hovering around uh, 80 or so. So it has mm -hmm. gone down one one third. And uh, that applies also to some other other products, um, raw materials, etc. And the Fed is, of course, working to reduce the money supply. But that takes time. In January... Uh, last year, so a year ago, we had 21,000 billion. That's a so-called money uh, supply M1. And in December, that was at 20 billion. So it has only gone down 5% in one year, in spite mm. of the several increase in the uh, interest rate. That takes time. That will take another 5 to 10 years. And that's why I say that inflation... Not at 10%, but around 5, 6, 7% will stay with us probably for 5 to 10 years, as it did in the 1970s. Hmm. So from a, well, I'll say from a marketing perspective, but consumer perspective even, like what is, what do you expect to be the implication of that? Because we had inflation that was around, floating around 2%, is that right? For a number of years. Yeah. Two to three percent, and now it will be at five or six. Even you think lower the next... in the tens, it was even lower. Okay, uh, it has a whole bunch of of consequences and implications. For instance, the consumer has to save more money, and uh, just uh, in one of our recent studies about 60% of the consumers say that, that they switch to cheaper products at the supermarket counter. Right. For vacation, only 18% say, said that. So there's obviously a very different mm. attitude towards for certain products daily, and services. Daily consumables and uh, for vacation. After three years of Corona, people want to get a vacation and are not as price sensitive. So somebody who does marketing mm. who sets pricing in tourism is in a very different situation from the guy who is exposed to tough competition in the supermarket. 
Hmm. Yeah, that or is what interesting. We, what we see uh, on, on a very large scale that uh, consumers who bought with, uh, say, with branded stores, stores which carry brands, are switching to um, discounters, hard discounters, uh, Aldi, etc. Mm -hmm. So this it, leads to, to strong shifts in the market shares of, of the retailers. Yeah. Well, it, and I, it's interesting. I mean, we were talking just before about like the systemic complexity of, of inflation. And so, you know, from a business perspective, you often hear things like, uh, you know, we, we like Walmart, you know, we pass on our savings to our customers and, you know, they you know, operate at efficiency and scale to be able to pass on those savings. And I think a lot of companies do that, but with the price of the goods and their acquisition and their supply chain, and all that also going up, then it's hard to maintain that low price so that you pass that on to customers as well. Right. And so then you have to increase price. <laughs> it's a fascinating like system. Um, it, it, how problematic is it for companies to adjust during these kinds of periods of time? Like in terms of normally you would think, well, it's discount, but now you might have to think you can't. The, the necessity is symmetric. You could say, if your costs increase, you have to pass through some of the costs may not uh, always the full extent. To your customers, otherwise your margin will squeeze to zero or to negative. But since competition works, if costs go down, you also have to pass on the cost decreases to your customer. Otherwise, you will not be competitive. So it right. moves in both direction, but there is a difference. <laughs> it's easier to cut prices than to increase prices. Yeah. So the risk, if you increase prices and go too far, fall off the cliff, uh, how much does the consumer, your customer accept? 5% price increase, 7%. And if you then, then do 15%, uh, you, you uh, will have a problem. For discounting, that's easier. I mean, the worst thing which can happen, this, happen in discounting is that the increased volume does not come. So you simply um, uh, sacrifice margin. But then can you can correct that. Right. But it's, uh, it's not so nice if you increase the price by 15% and then you have to take it back to 5% the next day. What, what uh, Tesla had to do, by the way, recently. Hmm. In Germany, it Tesla, if you count the subsidies of the, of the government, uh, which were no longer paid because the price was too high, they mm -hmm. increased the price mid last year by more than 20%. Now they took it back. Oh, really? Or that more than 20% people become price sensitive and don't buy as many Teslas any longer. And that's uh, yeah. kind of embarrassing. Yeah. It, well, yeah. It's, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of implications there, too. I'd imagine that if they're, yeah, they may now have to start advertising more <laughs> if, if, to get to pr try and communicate the value of that price. That um, is true. That is generally true. But uh, advertising is a more long-term oriented marketing instrument. You build an image brand right. and, uh, to compensate a 20% price increase by advertising usually does not work. In the uh, short term, for sure. We, right. um, we know that the so-called price elasticity Mm -hmm. That's how the price affects the volume of the market share is about 10, sometimes 20% higher than the advertising elasticity. So price, uh, price is a much more effective marketing instrument than advertising. If you, you double your advertising, you are lucky if sales go up or market share go, goes up 10%. Mm -hmm. If you increase uh, your price by 20%, your market share may fall by 30 or 40%. So price mm -hmm. is a much harder uh, marketing instrument than advertising. Yeah. So we were just talking about, hey, we were just talking about 
Tesla and how they've had to increase their prices. Um, and so we we're just talking about the impacts of advertising and whatnot. One of the things that I, I've been curious about it is when we're talking about inflationary costs um, going up for manufacturers and suppliers that are then selling to like a, a retailer or a distributor of some kind, a lot of times those are hard costs because of the cost of manufacturing, the cost of the products, the cost to acquire and ship and that kind of stuff. One of the things that I, would, I wanted to ask you the last time we were talking about is there's also this other substantial market around professional services where you're selling time basically which is has a slightly different thing it's harder to quantify the cost in a lot of the cases for the person's time and i'm sure you know that i mean your, your business is around consulting and operates on a model similar to that so you know in my past where you worked at an agency or you know working where we sold time for consulting services and things like that um how do how do organizations that are in that professional services space uh, how do they how are they affected by inflation and what kinds of things do you consider to be important for them to to think about actually time based pricing for profession, professional services is off the mark i had an experience many many years ago i went to one of the best international tax advisors in Germany, because in mm -hmm. our company, we had an international tax problem. He said within 15 minutes, that is the optimal solution. 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then he sent me an invoice of 2000 euros. Yeah. And I called him and said, that's a pretty high hourly rate. 2000 times four, 8000. And he yeah. said, you could have gone to your normal tax advisors, he would have worked five days on this problem and not given you the optimal solution. So I right. learned something in, in, in this experience. The problem is, especially ex ante, before you, you give the advice, you do the consulting project, it's very difficult for the customer to judge, to estimate the value you are delivering. That's why the time is used as a proxy. But what we increasingly do at Simon Kutcher is that we have a combination, time-based, say 50, 60%, and uh, result-based the rest. So if we can increase the profit by X percent, the client mm -hmm. will pay us a certain amount. That's value-oriented pricing there, of course. It's difficult to measure. Uh, you have to wait a year to see whether our recommendations really work. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is a trend that we see increasingly. Yeah, and, and I imagine that might be something that becomes more appealing to more service-based organizations because it's hard. Like I know we used to charge X number of dollars per hour, and it was hard to the customer's willingness to pay, you reach a threshold in hourly rates, but if you not package for value. Yeah. Um, if you hire Trump, you probably have to pay him 500,000 for one hour of a speech. Right. Uh, right. Or for Obama. <laughs> right. <laughs> a guy like me gets a, a small fraction. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so you see that in certain areas, we have value. Because it's clear that Trump or Obama have a much bigger value for an audience than Herman Simon. Right. Yeah. So, so you yeah. could have well, mixed look, pricing well, models. So for... if you look at, at, uh, at doctors uh, in, the, in the health sector, uh, the stars are much more expensive than a normal doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there's there's probably multiple pricing opportunities available for service-based yeah. organizations that yeah. you don't just have to stick but with. But the challenge there the is how can you communicate the value x ante so that the client is willing to pay five times or, or ten times more? Uh, it works only um, by uh, 
over the years building up a reputation or becoming famous or becoming a star. Uh, if I uh, call a client and say I'm I'm uh, five hundred thousand uh, verse for an hour, he, he says uh, that's ridiculous. So uh, you you have to build value, reputation, uh, competence. Mm -hmm. It's like building a brand. Yeah. There's some, something really interesting. Last time we talked about this formula, I, I honestly, I think every day I probably think about it in some way or another, which is the price, or sorry, profits equal price times volume minus cost. Um, in reading this book on inflation, there's a new wrinkle, maybe. Uh, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but I read about in your book talking about phantom profit. And so I'm just, <laughs> what I thought was a simple formula which was super elegant and very helpful now i feel it might yeah, be it's, uh, a bit more complicated a you know? formula you can think of yeah and uh, it helps us to understand the effectiveness of these three profit drivers for typical right. industrial or, or service case if we can increase price by one percent mm -hmm. and don't lose volume then mm -hmm. that's possible it, it could, for instance, mean you reduce your discount by 1%. That gives you an additional amount. Typically, the profit increases by 10%. Yeah. So this means the profit multiplier of price is 10. Okay. For cost, it's typically 6. Right. And for volume, it's only 4. Why? Because if we increase the volume, our marginal costs go up. So... The additional re mm -hmm. revenue from the volume increase is partially eaten up by the higher marginal cost. So we can say price is the most effective profit driver with a multiplier of 10. Cost is second with a multiplier of 6. And volume is third with a multiplier of 4. Mm -hmm. And then the the phantom profit part, can you talk about that? Uh, when we talk of profit, we should indeed uh, introduce several uh, terms. The, the simplest one is nominal profit versus real profit. Let's assume our costs increase 10%. Mm -hmm. We are able to pass the 10% through to our customers and we don't lose volume. Mm -hmm. Then our revenue is 10% higher. Our profit is also 10% higher. But what mm -hmm. have we gained in real terms? Nothing. The right. revenue goes up from 100 to 110, and we have to discount it by the inflation rate of 10%. So we haven't gained any. So our goal should be to defend real profit, which means we must increase profit more than the inflation rate. Phantom profit yeah. is a more complex issue. When we look at machines or investment from the past, we are only allowed to write them off at the purchasing cost. Right. But these purchasing costs five or ten years ago are not sufficient to replace the machinery. Mm -hmm. So we are only allowed to deduct the historical costs and when we bond, uh, want to buy a new machinery or invest in something new, we have too little money. money. So that's what we call phantom profit. Hmm. Uh, uh, very dangerous if the inflation is high. That's uh, very dangerous for financing because you are simply not able to uh, accumulate the necessary uh, budgets because the prices are much how, uh, higher now. So much higher, yeah. And, so, and yeah right. if, if you assume 10% or over seven years, that means that mm -hmm. prices double. 70 divided by 10 is in seven years, prices double. So the machine which costs $100, you have to replace it now, it costs $200. And you were only allowed to deduct 100 from your profit sheet. Mm hmm so, which brings up an interesting idea that, um, like, at the gas pump, we all see sort of these fluctuating prices happen all the time. Yeah. 
And, and I think part of that is related to the cost and, and inflation and so on. But, and we're used to it at the gas pump and it's the norm there. But as companies, most companies, I don't think, change their pricing as frequently as you'd see at the gas pump. That might be an ex, you know, one end of the spectrum. I feel like yeah. most other places, they hold their pricing for very long periods of time yeah. or they decrease it. And, and there's rarely yeah. that, you know, one day, you know, it cost me a buck 50 of getting like a coffee and the next day it's three or four. Like it doesn't happen yeah. that way, yeah. right? The gas pump is a very, very interesting case. If you look at the volume, it's almost constant over time. Right. Whereas if you look at the prices, it's as you just described it. And uh, to go back historically, in 2008, the price of the barrel was $145, even higher than last year. Mm -hmm. 2008. In 2020, the price of the barrel was $30. Then it right. went up to 125 again due to uh, Ukraine and these things. Now it's at around 80 or so. Now what is happening there? <laughs> Let's assume the price of 145 in 2008. All oil companies invested at such a high price, you make huge profit, same as last year. So they create an overcapacity. Oil exploration and uh, etc. are very long-term things. Ten mm -hmm. years later, or twelve years later, in 2020, we have an oversupply. Oil companies in the US were, were uh, hiring ships to to bunker their oil. They mm -hmm. they uh, it came out of their ears. Mm -hmm. Now they stop again producing, and price goes up again. So. Mm -hmm. The price in the oil market um, fluctuates and brings a balance to supply and demand. And we have what we call a hog cycle. The same you have for uh, many, many raw materials like for pigs and hogs. Uh, it goes up and down due to this cycle. If you have overcapacity, capacity is reduced. Uh, we have short supply. Prices go up. Then it becomes again in attractive mm -hmm. to invest. So... In the in the gas at the gas pump, we we cannot really talk of long term inflation. <laughs> Actually, the price now is lower than it was <laughs> fifteen years ago in two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. Strange, but we yeah. forget that we don't know or remember what the price was fourteen or fifteen years ago. Yeah, the the um. It, just the the gas pump idea, though, like is like I, is there something there from in terms of the gas the the price that consumers pay at the pump? Should we be managing price for most companies like they do at the pump, so there's more ups and downs, or is it more like because no. I feel like most things are no. stable. Yeah, that is yeah? true. It has to do with the uh, the long time periods for exploration for production investments so they need the price to adjust supply and demand and they cannot do that on a short-term uh, cycle say two or three years mm -hmm. if you um, develop a new uh, oil field or gas field it takes 10 years so mm -hmm. they need the price to uh, balance supply and demand that is not the case in in most other markets where the yeah. supply can be adjusted much more quickly. But and earlier we were talking about um, we, your expectation would be similar to past inflationary markets where you've got now a new norm of say five or six percent for the next five-ish years, as opposed to the one to three percent that we've had for the last 20 or 30. So with that in mind, is there a, a goal or objective that a lot of organizations to think about and marketers specifically to think about mechanisms to increase their price over time to, to compensate for that higher levels of inflation? Of course. Of yeah. course. I mean, if my costs are going up uh, and the next wave will be wages after these energy and electronic ships things. Mm -hmm. So 
I have to pass on these uh, cost increases. Otherwise, my profits will be squeezed and uh, I am in, 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 in big danger. So mm -hmm. we have to find a new culture, you could say. For instance, yesterday, um, interesting experience of appearance from, of the CEO of Nestle. Nestle from Switzerland is the largest food manufacturer in the world. And the CEO, hmm. Mark Schneider, friend of mine, he organized, you can say, a global press conference where mm -hmm. he stands in front of the journalists and says, we will increase prices further this year. We have to right. catch up. So the CEO of a very large company, about 100 billion in revenue, he takes on the role to to bring the bad news that prices for food will further have to increase. And I think that is very important for the, the workforce, for the sales force, that the uh, mm -hmm. CEO says, I, I stand behind you. We have to do it. Uh, we cannot mm -hmm. evade this. Is that what you mean by profit defense, is, is by incorporating some of those price increases to maintain course, profit? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, you have to build uh, willpower, pricing power. Uh, your customers are not accepting that or welcoming uh, that easily. So you have to work hard to prepare the market and the customers that they accept the necessary price increases. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important for the morale of the, uh, the troop. You, you touched on there something, Herman, that I think for, for us it's, um, you know, the way at least Mark and I kind of look at it is almost like in a systemic effect that's going on. So usually when you're thinking about an inflation and how companies manage it, it's they're going to increase their their costs and their products and services usually get increased. Uh, but what they don't do is hold or increase the wages. Now that reduces potentially the buying power of the consumer in that, in that moment of time, which then results into further discounting potentially because no one's buying the product because it can't quote unquote, afford it. Now, it seems like it's, you know, it's not easy to balance. But when we're thinking about managing inflation, is there a better way to manage it? Even if it means in, in theory, what should companies be doing instead? Wages will go up. That's unavoidable. Because people need more money to buy their daily goods to pay for energy or whatever it is. So it's unavoidable that wages will go up. That varies from country to country, uh, from industry to industry. And uh, in, in many countries, uh, we have now a short supply of talented people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we in our consulting company, we had to increase the wages massively. It's again, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to find good people, you have to pay more. Yeah. Or to keep people from from shunning or leaving. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it uh, Vasily, it works kind of automatically. It's, it's unavoidable if prices go up 5, 7, 10% that wages go up. But, but from what I understand, it doesn't happen at the same time. You know, the, the increase in wages, yeah. Ladder, yeah. there's probably a lag to that. And I don't have this. The, the... It's a time lag. Yeah. Is there, is there a... You could, you could uh, depending on the country and, and the habits of negotiations, the role of trade unions, you could say uh, there's a time lag of, of one year between the prices going up and the wages following. It depends also... In, in many countries, uh, trade unions make uh, contracts with employers for a certain period mm -hmm. for two years right. or so. And of course, then only after two years, the wages are adjusted. But what we also see is a lot of uh, voluntary wage increases. Right. Mm -hmm. for instance, uh, Lufthansa offered a bonus of, of, of 3,000 euros or dollars to all employees last year there so it like counting for the time like with that with the employee wages 
an organization, the leader in an organization may go, okay, well, I know I'm going to have to do this over a period of time, this course of, this, of the course of this year, in which case I need to account for that cost, especially if it's a service oriented organization. Um, and so are you better off with going with like a Tesla approach you talked about? Like tomorrow we're increasing our prices by 20% or should you increase pricing gradually or change different into different models yeah, of pricing? Yeah. I, I, I think uh, that more frequent, smaller price increases are much better than infrequent, large price increases. When you go back to the stable period, 2% price increase per year, you went once to your customer and asked for a modest price increase of 2%, once mm -hmm. a year. Now, costs are changing all the time, and you have to be very agile and quick in order not to fall behind the cost increases. And we have seen many companies, uh, large companies, small companies, who have increased their prices four, six, some eight times last year. Mm -hmm. For instance, Michelin is the global leader in, in tires. They have increased their prices six times. Mm -hmm. But uh, with a smaller amount than if they would only do it once per year. So is that... I mean, you've got a, in the book, in this book, you talk a lot about different kind of pricing strategies. Um, is that sort of the idea behind being agile and, and being you know, preemptive with pricing? Or is yeah, it the same thing uh, as smart pricing? Are they different yeah. entirely? In, in, inflation means that uh, cost figures, prices, uh, competitive behavior is changing all the time. Every Every week, something changes. So you have to get the information. You have to be agile, quick, fast in collecting the data, the information. And you have to be agile and fast in implementing the necessary decisions. Changes. Mm -hmm. You cannot wait half a year, then the year is, is lost. You have to stay very close to the action in the market and then to react very quickly. If, if things hmm. change... Um, you have to be quick. If things don't change, you can afford to be slow. Mm -hmm. Is there any like novel or unique or innovative pricing strategies that people should consider at times like, especially at times like this, where you know you're going to have a standard higher inflation rate for the next period of time? I think that is, is a very important question uh, because when we talk of pricing we usually think price up price down mm -hmm. one dimensional right what we should consider is to change the pricing model i just mentioned uh, michelin the french global market leader for tires they mm -hmm. introduced a new truck tire which runs 25 percent longer now a truck tire costs thousand dollars and all the truckers know $1,000. You cannot charge $1,250 for a tire. Mm -hmm. So they switch their model to price per mile or mile or a price per kilometer. Mm -hmm. Totally different. And there they were able to increase the capture by 25%. Mm -hmm. Or I always uh, show this card from the German Railroad Corporation. Oh, yeah. I remember, yeah. This is fascinating. Yeah. That's also yeah, yeah. important for the inflation uh, because this card costs 500 uh, euros and it's called Bahncard 50 because I get a discount of 50% on all tickets for the duration of one year. So if the Railroad Corporation... Uh, increased price by 5%, I'm only affected by 10%, uh, I'm only affected by 5%. Yeah. This card well, yeah. reduces the price increase by 50%. So these are, uh, there are dozens of other new uh, pricing models. Um, and, and, and that is a very important avenue to uh, cope with inflation. To think My of ski different ways uh, 
for instance, uh, I don't know whether you, you have that in, in uh, Canada or uh, you have experienced that. We were in an in a, in a, uh, Asian restaurant where you could offer small things like sushi, etc., several rounds right. for a flat rate, $20. Mm -hmm. But if you order too much and return some of mm -hmm. the pieces, they charge $1 per piece. Understood? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. That is, I, I found that very interesting. Otherwise, with the flat rate, people just order more than they have hunger or eat. And uh, now, if you return <laughs> five uh, uneaten pieces, you have to pay $5. It's like a re <laughs> I mean, they don't re reshelf or restock it, but it's kind of like yeah. a restocking fee in a way. No, yeah. I don't think that they will reuse it again, but uh, yeah. it's a disincentive to order too much. So, and yeah. of course, it's, uh, it's a profit contribution. So buffets are a bad deal. People are actually willing yeah. to pay that, but it's uh, the rule. Yeah. The ski hill that I, I'm at uses the, the bank. Is a band card? Is that the, the train card? Bond, it's called band. Bond. Bond means rail. So a right. rail car okay. translated. So, yeah. so the ski hill that I go to has a similar thing that you buy a card for 90 bucks then you get half off of yeah. all your other tickets i mean amazon prime is also two-dimensional here we go from a one-dimensional price the ticket price to a two-dimensional price with the second dimension the card price and for the first class that's uh, 500 euros yeah so it's, you mentioned it's not inexpensive uh, shrinkflation earlier and maybe just can we just talk about that because that's another pricing strategy right or, yeah yeah pricing I'm I'm not so sure um, whether I would call it a pricing or a deception strategy. <laughs> um, Probably the latter. I I am against it due to two reasons. First, consumers feel deceived. Right. Second, it's not a permanent uh, measure against inflation. You can only do it once. You cannot every every quarter or every half year shrink the package size <laughs> and i actually smaller. switched punished one supplier of yogurt i usually bought uh, this yogurt brand and they reduced the size from 500 to 400 grams now i don't buy it any longer and mm -hmm. um, there has been a lot of discussion in the press so it also gives uh, that that will bad advertising so i mm -hmm. do not recommend it Hmm. Um, can you jump in here? Anyway? Yeah. Just no, no, no. <laughs> like, obviously, one of the things that you know, at least from from our perspective, that I think is interesting, especially from uh, the lens of a marketer, right? So when we think about like you know, it, especially during inflationary periods, our competition or competition may likely look to increase prices um, and whatnot. Uh, so if we were to increase, say, our price, but say our competitors didn't. Now, is this where pricing power comes into play? Or you can almost like reset the table somehow? Because if not every company is following, say, a leader that it's gone yeah, to increase, yeah. is there a chance yeah. there for marketers to capitalize on that? Or how do you see that relationship? Of course, pricing power comes into the play. I, I probably have used this example of <clears throat> Apple versus Samsung or uh, Huawei, if Apple for the iPhone would increase the price by 10%, they would not lose many customers, maybe 2%. Right. So the price elasticity would be 2 divided by 10.2. If Samsung or Huawei did that, they might lose 20%. The price elasticity would be 20 divided by by 10. So if you have pricing power, what uh, Apple obviously does, you can afford to raise your price in spite of the competition not following. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a specific aspect of, of pricing power because your customers, I, I, I don't know any, any uh, iPhone user who is willing to switch from iPhone to another brand. Yeah. It's I I it's funny because I 
did, but now I kind of like <laughs> I lost my phone at one point, or I thought I lost yeah. it, and then I'm like, I Even wish I had Even my grandson, who is 11 years old, he refused to get a cheaper iPhone, a cheaper <clears> phone. Yeah. Um, the other one that I wanted to ask you about is what kinds of messaging. So along that line, like what kind of messaging can marketers focus on to either increase pricing power and maybe it's the same as um, combat inflation. Yeah, I think the core is is value, value communication, innovation, higher value uh, through innovation. That is a uh, the most effective way to deal with that. Again, that is probably not a, a, a short-term solution because when mm -hmm. you innovate, you have to invest to do R&D, but that is the most important way to, to go. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are also other, other tricks by offering uh, additional services. I mentioned these 10 million wine bottles. Right. They bought them from a glass factory and the, the, the wine trading company, since they have enough capacity with trucks, etc., they picked them up at the plant of the glass factory. Usually they were delivered. Right. But now since they had, the, so they offered a service, uh, we don't only buy the product, we come to pick them up, which saved mm -hmm. the glass factory uh, a lot of, of money. If you think of the of 10 billion uh, million bottles yeah. and so you have to go through each uh, value driver service and see where can i offer something uh, reduce costs be uh, better than my competition mm -hmm. and um, we we had a discussion the other day that time plays an important role what are the levers which we can change fast? Well, it doesn't take a year or so, mm -hmm. innovation, etc. And uh, I think that is an important aspect. What can we change fast to mm -hmm. cope with innovation? I imagine things like, especially now, I mean, this is almost the perfect time to have more conversations about pricing in general. And and maybe some of those fast levers could be just looking at the existing services you have and thinking about bundling. And if you don't do it already, but just to me, that seems like an, a simple approach to do something quickly. Creating a new bundle. Um, uh, that, that is another you hadn't offered thing. Before. Yeah. That is another interesting. If you have products, which you can bundle in a, in a productive way, uh, that's an interesting way to offer more value, attract more and more customers. Uh, but of course, costs may be a problem because you have to offer the bundle at a bundle discount. Right. Uh, people buy at McDonald's uh, a Coke, fries and uh, a burger because the bundle is cheaper than the sum of the added uh, right. components. Um, so it can become a little more difficult. It, it could also be in some cases that unbundling is uh, the price. True. Because yeah. the bundle price may be, may be too high. Right. Sometimes you actually see these, these large um, CFMG companies where they'll look to bundle products that are still within the family of products in, in totality. Um, but it's actually not things that you would, you know, potentially uh, buy together. Yeah. Like I think of like dish soap and then um, yeah. Yeah. maybe this is a bad example, but hand soap or a deodorant and razors. Now, it's they're still pro something. probably part yeah. of this. Yeah. It, yeah. Right. It's, it's just. That's go ahead. a good point. Bundling uh, usually makes more sense if the products are complementary they complement each other like say wine and cheese uh, or uh, mm -hmm. computer yeah. programs uh, from from microsoft uh, and, and not uh, sneakers and mineral water or something like this hmm. yeah. this may be this may be a silly question but you know one thing you don't see very often is like Companies that may not normally work together don't come together in these instances f to offer maybe a unique bundle to a consumer. Now, I can already think of reasons why no 
two companies that are either competitors or they're working outside of whatever really uh, come together for that. Have you seen, though, in any instances to help, you know, from an inflation perspective, like where companies think start thinking really outside of the box and maybe start partnering with companies that they haven't thought of in the past to offer a unique product or service? Uh, when, I, when, when I see that or saw that, it's mostly cost driven. For instance, uh, right. that they merge the sales force and the sales force offers both products from both companies. Right. It's mm -hmm. uh, not so much oh, I see, yeah. uh, driven by the value side from the bundling perspective. It, um, I know we only have a couple of minutes left, but you just mentioned Salesforce, which was a light bulb in my <laughs> brain that just went up because sales and marketing often go together and, and it's such a big part of the purchase price is ended up managed by the sales force. And, um, and so I wonder from your perspective, is there ideas that you've seen or thoughts about uh, sales force that can help during these in inflationary periods? One observation is that the churn rate in sales forces has uh, quite dramatically increased because the salespeople are exposed to so much pressure. Imagine, in the old stable world, you had to go once to your customers, ask for models, price increase. Now you come every every two or three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the psychological pressure on you is, is dramatic. Uh, the other point is when we talk of value communication as le an effective lever to, to create more higher willingness to pay, of mm -hmm. course, you need salespeople who can communicate value instead of mm -hmm. negotiating the price all the time. So right. you, you need a different type, ideally, of salesperson. One who is good at building customer relationship, communicating price, and not so much uh, selling through uh, discounts and devoting most of his time to price uh, negotiations. But these people are, of course, difficult to find. Mm hmm. Herman, this has been fascinating. Uh, like, I, if, you, if you have any other questions, go ahead. But um... uh, yeah, it, just be super quick. If if you were to give one 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 advice, if you will, to any to any practitioner, uh, either in marketing and sales and whatnot, to help circumvent twenty twenty three as we're kind of going through it, what would be that piece of advice that you would solicit? If you could. Yeah. If I can give advice to the CEO of the company. Sure. I would suggest that he or she involves, addresses all functions. It's not only a matter of Salesforce or price. It's also a matter of procurement. Um, mm -hmm. But sorry, I, mm -hmm. you may not have been there, but we the sent 10 million <laughs> wine bottles. Uh, which they bought because this large wine terrain company, they had no more bottles in the last fall. They couldn't sell wine because now <laughs> they bought 10 million. You cannot imagine how much that is at a price 50% oh higher. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So you see, it's, it's, it's crazy. If they don't have yeah. the bottles, uh, they, they cannot do uh, business. And that's the role yeah. of the purchasing guy or the procurement guy to get these bottles. So involve all functions it's not only a price issue it's a, a more fundamental comprehensive issue and challenge hmm. Hmm. that's great advice. and of course yeah. uh, read the book beating inflation because there are many more <laughs> ideas there yeah. <laughs> and don't reduce marketing budgets yeah. right no. <laughs> herman this has been fascinating i really appreciate your time uh, for this and, and all, all the time you had in helping us a reschedule and all that. So I, this has yeah, been fantastic. Uh, the book is great. It, it has opened up my mind to a lot of ideas and um, I really appreciate all your thought and expertise. Okay. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it and uh, take care. Thank, thank you, you, Herman. Time for the post pod discussion with Mark and V. P, is it that time again? Postpone! <laughs> ah, there it is. <laughs>
<laughs> so uh that was i love talking to herman he's so smart um and so you you were a bit late to the the pod so let me just kind of catch you up on some of the things that he mentioned the the wine bottle thing uh so maybe let's just start let's there. start there yeah um it, it was fascinating because and you mentioned it too in one of your questions there's this idea of a lag right yeah and so he mentioned that there's this company that was a distributor i think for wine and during COVID, at one point they couldn't make any money because they didn't have bottles for their for their wine so right. they went out and bought like 10 million bottles and he had just <laughs> come back from touring the the warehouse where they store are like 10 million bottles oh my gosh so now they've got wine or then now they have <laughs> bottles. bottles and they can sell wine yeah so now they can sell their wine but but it's interesting because the lag effect right you had this instance during covid where you couldn't get stuff and a lot of people were affected by that yeah. now they went and compensated to cover and make sure that they didn't run into that same supply chain issue mm -hmm. um, but they had to pay 50 percent. i think he said 50 percent higher price for those bottles and so there's this constant like lag within all these systems and reaction yeah. time to try and compensate for a lot of inflationary things and for me one of the big takeaways was really just that we had been sort of lulled into this thinking of Inflation is pretty standard at two to let's call it two percent plus or minus. Right. And now he his thought is that we were as high as I think he said ten percent in the summer. Wow. And it'll come down to or roughly around five or six if it follows a similar pattern to the previous inflationary periods. So we you know, if we're at five or six for the next five years, mm -hmm. um, like that has that's twice as much at least twice as much inflation, maybe three times as much inflationary costs. Yeah. Uh, that's going to impact businesses for the next foreseeable future. What was interesting is that he, he was talking about organizations during these times need to maintain and be really agile and really flexible as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting takeaway from, because when, when you think about, you know, pricing strategies and, and whatnot from a consumer perspective, there's only so much volatility that you can you're you're kind of willing to accept before you're like, hey, maybe I'm gonna go to something else instead. So I thought, yeah, I thought from my perspective, it's like when I'm thinking and hearing about this being remaining agile, remaining flexible, and have some elasticity, if you will. I don't know how organizations can actually do that in a way that potentially wouldn't affect, you know, um, some of their downstream processes. Cause if you think about like inducing a new pricing action into a market, depending on the industry that you may be doing, it, there's, there's a lot of time that goes into that. You know, sure. when I think about like uh, the airline industry, like putting pricing in the market is not something you just like, okay, I'm just going to wake up today and it's going to be this. Yeah. Like there's a lot of work that goes into that. So maintain that elasticity, if you will. I don't know if that's actually operational or it can be operationalized in the same way. Of course, I understand the nuances, but you know, between industries. But I think it's uh, yeah. How do you stay nimble and, and versatile in that state? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, to start with, and you know, I think we, the previous conversation that we had with her, I mean, we talked about price being probably the least talked about of the four. <laughs> the neglected stepchild. Yeah, <laughs> and and now I think maybe that's. You know, if we think about the four P's as the levers that, that marketers have to play with, price, promotion, uh, promotion is the most common one, probably, right. uh, place and, and product. Um, there's a lot of ways, just by thinking about the four P's, that marketers, a lot of levers that marketers have to pull, a lot more than they probably consider. And if That's true. price, in fact, is one of those things where majority of people aren't talking about it, then it could be a, a great tool for marketers to come up with new ideas and solutions, you know, and invest time into like doing the market research uh, to try and understand what's going on in the market. Um, you know, it's, it's important. It's valuable because it does drive profit, um, which is ultimately what we're doing. We don't always have to pull the promotional lever, right? Yeah. You can create new product with bundling. You can create new product with just pricing strategy in general, but, or unbundling, as Herman mentioned. So it's it's interesting to me because 
it opens up a lot more possibility uh, to help a company be responsive to change. Yeah, you know what? And maybe, uh, you know, and that as marketers, we kind of, again, and I was stuck in that mindset is like, well, hey, from a marketing perspective, we're responsible for more of the promotion side. But you're right. Like the, the reality is, is if we retain that notion that we're the voice of the consumer inside of our organizations, then our influence spans genuinely like the four P's. So how do we make mm -hmm. ourselves more, you know, if the right word is here, um, more not available. I, I think that's not the right word, but making sure that we are driving that that conversation as it pertains to mm -hmm. all the P's, then there is value. And I think mm -hmm. we're, what we're seeing, and I'm sure like you, you're, you have same insights as well. One of the first things that happens during these inflationary periods is like marketing budgets tend to dry up. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously any article you read, it's like, no, you have to maintain some level of pressure in the market where you're continuously advertising. I think it was what Ehrenberg and Bass Institute, like in 2018, I think it was, they did a study that, you know, the longer that you stop advertising, mm. your average yeah, yeah. sale drops. I think like what, 16%, I think in the first year, then it goes after two years, like 25%. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, organizations still do that, right? Or they reduce sure. it enough to a point where it's like, why are we even doing this? Yeah. So I guess where I'm going with this is like there, there's a balance here that needs to have, that needs to happen within organizations to maintain that. And Carmen said just at the end there, he's like, if a CEO is responsible, he's talking to all the functions equally on how to address inflation and kind of giving mm -hmm. everyone that equal opportunity to think about what what areas make sense to potentially you know change strategies on or whatever. So, yeah. Um, the only thing I would offer here is is saying that don't think of inflation just from a pricing perspective. You have to think of inflation and how you combat that in organization through all the levers that you have at your disposal. Yeah. 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 No, that's a good point. It, it, a couple of things just, um, as you were saying that maybe reflect on the conversation. So one of the things <clears throat> that Herman said, had talked about right at the beginning, just before you're jumping on is that, some markets or some industries are more affected than others. So right. as an example, he brought up travel. The people who are in the travel category, like vacationers and that kind yeah. of thing, are more willing to pay for travel than they are for some things, than general consumers are for things like, you know, things that you get at the grocery store. They're looking to substitute lower cost items there in order to save that money yeah. to put into things that matter a lot to them. So. That was kind of interesting. So not every industry is affected the same way. That's true. Um, by inflation, which I thought was fascinating. And, and I think it's a, a a good reason to do that research and gut check on like, yeah. are people within the customer's willingness to pay within your industry? Yeah. Are they affected this, you know, the same way that you would expect all consumers would be? So that was interesting. And the second part was thinking about uh, the price lever and particularly probably b2b where the salespeople manage price right a lot more intimately um i think it's important that the marketing side also considers how you communicate value so that's not just about lower cost but it's also about like incremental value or benefits for the for the consumer or the buyer or the purchaser right so they feel that there's worth in this, uh, that it's worth it for paying a higher price, whether they know it's a higher price or not. But, you know, increasing the transactional costs or the deal size or, you know, that kind of thing, the profitability of every deal. Yeah, he brought up apples. What was it? He said, like, Apple can increase their the price by 10% and likely won't affect their, you know, their sales. And it's yeah. like, the, you know, thinking about the, the strength of the brand in that moment. This goes back to, you know, my other points, like you can't make, you can't really go back on investments too much if you want to maintain mm -hmm. that level of, uh, you know, mental availability, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting, the, the uh, when we, maybe they're not levers, but we think of all the different aspects of around pricing and how you can combat that is almost like you need to take that one organization approach to assure like you're, you're navigating the best you can. Research is important. 
And I, I mm-hmm. you know, I'll be honest. I, I don't think I've worked for an organization where research is always front and center. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that doesn't mean it sh- it's, they've been operating or the right way. I think if you think mm-hmm. about all the guests that we've talked to, research always keeps coming up. And um, I know it's something that yeah. I would change. Yeah, totally. And it's, yeah, I agree. I think it is really important for a whole bunch of reasons. But I, I, anytime I think about this, I, there's a, Mark Ritson has a really great uh, formula or discipline, let's call it, for a marketing approach. And it starts with market orientation. Hmm. Um, and there's a great diagram that's out there called Marketing Land that I oh, think right. about all the time. And it really does start with like understanding the customer. And understanding like yeah. all the things around them before you get into developing your targeting strategy, your, your segmentation, your targeting, your positioning, and then developing your product and so on and so forth. Because if you don't understand what's going on with the customer and their mindset, then you can make all kinds of decisions that may not land yeah. the way you thought it may land, right? Totally. So it's a way of imp- improving your odds of success just by understand- spending a bit of time to understand the customer base to begin with. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for the pause there. I'm just like I'm thinking. I'm thinking back to why. I was it's watching not... you thinking. You know, <laughs> you like, this is good. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> well, you know, I just again reflecting on my own experience. This is like I don't have a good reason why I didn't lean on research more. I, mm-hmm. It was just not part of. I don't want to call it the vernacular, but maybe it is. Like we just we would use research at a very high level to help guide some, you know, some, some, some big thoughts in terms of like the direction yeah. we're going, it would influence maybe the vision or the ethos of an organization. But outside of that, we weren't spending much time on the research side from the consumer perspective. We were, mm-hmm. our heads were buried deep on a lot of the, the performance analytics that we were getting and we we're mm-hmm. making decisions on that. And it's just, you know, it's really interesting that the more and more people we talk to, It's just, it's the exact opposite. So I think when we're bringing it back from an inflation perspective, how to circumvent that from an organization, like talk to your customers Mm -hmm. and then, you know, work back from that and see potentially, you know, what, what you can make better. You know, you mentioned in the, which is the bundling effect. It's great. You know, what can that actually look like? Or the debundling as, as Herman called it, there, there are ways to, to kind of make sure that you maintain the mental availability you're still pricing competitively and you're able to circumvent the, you know, I guess the, the recession and the inflationary period here um, mm-hmm. in a very manageable way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so much to think about. Um, yeah. And just on that note too, like, re- like you're right. I don't think research has to be big formal no. market surveys per se, <clears> looking <throat> at brand, like mostly whenever I thought about research, it was about brand awareness consideration totally and and preference probably yeah and those were like typically what i thought of as being the core tenets of any kind of research because that was usually we brought in a research agency and that's what they did yeah but there's all kinds of like you're right customer feedback is there's all kinds of stuff and research that you can do there understanding who the customers are who the decision makers are what are their choices like what kinds of things do they buy you know yeah. like there's it doesn't have to be giant, big budget things. It can be also all that small data that comes in for all the different departments, which is what I think is so smart why Herman talked about involving all customers or all parts of the you know, agents or the, of the company. Of the company, yeah. Say. So for you, what would be the biggest takeaway if someone to say, if you were to summarize this podcast into one like little sound bite, what do you think it is for you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> i'm trying to think i'm trying to th- i'm trying to think oh. of the title that's why i'm asking you <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh you know i i think that the one i think the one takeaway is that inflation is here probably here for a while yeah it's it's, it's probably going to be double what it was maybe triple what it was so that five six percent and we need to think about the long-term implications yeah. of that and how we're going to manage costs and price in general um, to keep and maintain the profitability of an organization. 
yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fantastic point because so how you affect, you know, cost and price, but also, you know, if we use the marketing lens on it, like your brand, right? Right. How, how are you going to make sure you're navigating? If this is going to be an extended, you know, period and it's going to jump double, triple or whatever the case may be, brands will be, will definitely have an impact to this and the perception and the consumer. So anything that you've been able to build could all be lost if you don't look mm -hmm. at it and think about it the right way uh, as you're managing this. So I think that's a very great takeaway. Yeah. If there is like if there is a title, maybe it's something like <laughs> "Inflation's here to stay." Now what? No. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like it, it just, it like I, I previously to this conversation thought of inflation going up and then down, and it would be back to that one two percent. Just go back to up to three yeah. percent. But that's by the sounds of it not what's going to happen. So we need to think about and account for that yeah. change in how we kind of communicate. Um, and package the services, products and services that we have. Yeah. No, that's a great point. V? Dude. It's good chat. It was great chat. Herman, yeah. thank you once again. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Herman. It was really fun. Thanks for, um, we had a whole bunch of complications <laughs> trying oh to get this gosh. set up. So, <laughs> but I appreciate that and appreciate uh, all the work from <laughs> his, his team and helping us coordinate and setting this up. So, that was a pleasure. Thanks to you guys, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome, man. Well, see you in the next one, man. Okay. Adieu. Adieu. Have a great evening. D a day. Jesus God. Like <laughs> it's morning now. There is sun. God. I'm just having a day. I'm just having a day. Right. Uh, Be good, buddy. Still yeah, you too. Buddy.